Hi everyone, it's a pleasure uh, to be back here uh, to discuss uh, an update on, on Project Libra. Uh, I'm Christian Catalini, one of the co-creators of Libra uh, at Economist at Navi and uh, a professor at MIT currently uh, on leave. <clears throat> Feel free to post your questions uh, in, in the live uh, chat. I will try to answer them uh, as we go. First, the distinction. So uh, as you know, Libra uh, is not an independent organization. Uh, where Facebook is actually only one of 27 members. Uh, that means about, uh, you know, less than 4% of the governance and, and voting um, of the entire organization. Uh, there's a number of different entities contributing to the growth and success of the ecosystem. Uh, on the other side, Novi is a digital wallet that will be provided by Facebook uh, and will integrate with the Libra payment uh, system. So I want to draw that distinction since it will be useful uh, through the content of the talk. <clears throat> which will actually focus on the economics of Libra. Uh, as I mentioned to you, uh, and those of you that attended last year, uh, the journey has been really a journey around developing a new model uh, for trust in digital platforms. And this really goes back to work uh, that I had done with my co-author, Joshua Gans, on really thinking through, you know, what does it mean uh, that you can use blockchain technologies and cryptocurrencies uh, to, to develop new forms um, new forms of uh, interaction, economic interactions, uh, and new models for, for market design uh, in digital platforms. Uh, at the time, we were focused on kind of two dimensions, uh, two key costs, the cost of verification and the cost of networking. Uh, the second one is, is, is really closely related to, to the efforts behind Libra and essentially building distributed governance uh, on, uh, on an infrastructure that can support uh, payments uh, and also later financial applications uh, on a global scale. Now, there, there's at least three main objectives in the economic design of Libra. Uh, the first one uh, is to build trust in an efficient medium of exchange and the payment network. And it's often talked about uh, across a number of, of different topics from uh, macroeconomic policy and others. <clears throat> the second one is you know, the, the resulting market uh, on top of the Libra protocol. Uh, and ensuring that there is competition and interoperability at the core of everything the, the network stands for. Uh, the last one I want to also expand on today is really the trust in the governance and future evolution of the network and some of the journey that we've done uh, since uh, the original uh, white paper. There's a number of key updates in the economic design of Libra uh, from, of course, uh, the introduction of single currency stable coins. I'll expand on that uh, in a second. Uh, to kind of changing the future transition to permissionless, uh, while at the same time trying to replicate the core economic properties that we, um, I think all of us appreciate in permissionless networks uh, within, within the Libra framework. Uh, there's also a number of improvements to the Libra reserve, and this is kind of really spurred by uh, extensive feedback that Libra has received uh, from reports like the G7 stablecoin uh, report or the FSB work on, on global stablecoins. Now let's start with the trust in the efficient payment network. Um, <clears throat> as I was mentioning, now there's two types of Libra coins. There's the single currency stable coins. Think about something like a Libra dollar, Libra euro, Libra pound. Uh, but also the network is retaining a concept of a multi-currency coin, uh, LBR, uh, although it's fundamentally changed from the one uh, of the original white paper. The new LBR was, will be essentially a digital composite of some of the single currency stable coins available on the network. And I'll tell you a bit more on how that works. <clears throat> so on the single currency stablecoin, uh, this will actually enable a number of additional use cases. Um, as you may know, the original goal was to support cross-border payments like remittances. Uh, but with the introduction of single currency stablecoins, a number of domestic use cases in the relevant markets also become possible. Like in the original uh, white paper, each one of the single currency stablecoins will be fully backed, so one for one. Uh, and I'll get actually uh, to some details on how it will be over collateralized uh, to really absorb potential losses uh, on a number of potential risk and, and dimensions. And uh, you know, how people, uh, users, consumers, and businesses will interface with the reserve will really be supported by a competitive market for uh, resellers and exchanges that will be buying and selling these coins uh, to and from the reserve. Now, over time, this new approach also allows maximum flexibility to central banks around the world to, to think about how they want to integrate with something like the Libra network, uh, how this can support uh, you know, their efforts in upgrading payment systems, and more broadly, the journey towards uh, hybrid CBDCs, synthetic CBDCs, or wholesale CBDCs. 
the goal is really one where, you know, as soon as some of these public sector efforts become available, Libra could stop operating the relevant reserve and replace it with the public sector asset. So really think about Libra as this layer on top of whatever the public sector will do in the spaces that enables a range of new functionality and a range of new features for low cost, you know, low frictions, instantaneous uh, payments, both domestic where the single currency stable coins are available and cross-border when they're not yet, uh, you know, on the network. <clears throat> now the multi-currency Libra coin, um, it's, it's kind of re redesigned in, in, this, uh, in this new version of the white paper. Uh, it is now essentially just a digital composite. Think of it as aggregating together in fixed nominal weights, so fixed amounts, uh, some of the single currency stable coins uh, available on the network. Now, because each one of the single currency stable coins is fully backed, as a result, the multi-currency Libra is also fully backed. It's also not really a separate asset from the single currency stable coin. It will not be minted and burned by the reserve. It will be just stapled and unstapled by some of the participants operating on the network. Now, this design is actually similar to the special drawing rights maintained by the IMF. And over time, the goal is really to pass oversight and control of the composition of, of the multi-currency Libra coin potentially to uh, neutral third party, uh, such as the IMF or the group of central banks uh, involved uh, in, in that particular uh, composition. Now, since it's not a peg to any single currency, as the value of any one of the components moves, the value of the multi-currency LBR uh, will move with respect to uh, any local currency. Here on this slide, you're looking at some of the potential flows. So if you imagine maybe two countries, let's say the network has a Libra dollar and a Libra Euro, uh, and someone is trying to send money from the US to Europe, that transfer could start in Libra dollars, would go through likely a wallet exchange or financial intermediary to perform the conversion. Uh, this is not happening actually on chain. Uh, and the receiver would receive it in, in Libra Euro and, you know, potentially they could spend it on merchants, local goods and services um, in, in their own country. Now, if the receiving uh, country does not have a single currency stablecoin on the network yet, they may decide to receive this in any one of the uh, currencies available on the network, including the multi-currency LBR. Why would they use maybe the multi-currency LBR? Is because you can think of it as a neutral, low volatility option uh, with the respect to a number of potential jurisdictions. Uh, and it, you know, in flow C, you're looking at two countries that do not have a single currency stablecoin on the network yet. That flow could start in LBR, could arrive in LBR, so no conversion needed. Uh, and of course, you know, when the, the person receiving, for example, that remittance flow wants to spend it, they would convert it into local fiat using a cash in and cash out uh, provider. So as you see, this new design is much more flexible and enables a range of, of kind of new use cases on, on how the network could operate in, in different uh, jurisdictions. The, the other effort uh, that's currently underway is really adding additional protection in the design of the Libra Reserve. And here we're really trying to break new ground into the design of stable coins in general. Uh, the G7 stablecoin report, as well as the FSB report, raise a number of issues and questions around what happens when you know, a stable coin is experienced extreme market situations, uh, very much like you know, what, what happened uh, after the COVID outbreak or in 2008. And so the structure and administration of the Libra Reserve is now designed to really mitigate those threats and, and, and allow for value preservation uh, of coins over time. Uh, here, we're really importing the best practices from the financial sector. Think about the Basel framework uh, and, and other relevant uh, frameworks that are used to really think about a number of potential losses that something like a stable coin could incur. Uh, this could be losses from credit risk, uh, market risk, so changes in interest rates, or operational risk. Like any, any endeavor, uh, there's always uh, dimensions of operational risk. And so this is something that we, we did a lot of work uh, in, in the last months, um, working towards a framework that can really provide strong guarantees uh, to coin holders and businesses operating on the network. <clears throat> now, of course, all of this really starts with transparency and auditability. Uh, the reserve needs to be not only audited on a regular basis, but that information about the backing <clears throat> needs to be transparently communicated in, in uh, you know, practically real time uh, to the public. So that will be a really important dimension for building trust in, in, in the coins. Uh, there's also, as I was mentioning, work on, on really the regulatory capital requirements and regulatory buffers. The intuition here is that the buffer that the Libra reserve will, will maintain will grow as both the assets uh, grow in risk, maybe because there's a change in market condition, 
or as the reserve size itself uh, grows in time. Without getting into too many of the technical details, this is pretty standard, but like yeah, there's this gonna be a component of a pillar one requirement that Vibra will be expected to maintain at all times and additional capital buffers uh, under a pillar two. Uh, you know, how will the network fund uh, these requirements? Well, you know, like any other business, to retain earnings or through capital that's raised uh, from, from its investors. Now, often people ask, how will Libra uh, be able to support, uh, you know, stable coins in currencies that face negative yields? Um, you know, we can think about a Libra Euro, for example. Well, the, the short answer is that it will have to cover these costs through additional revenue streams. It could be additional transaction or other fees that are introduced on, on the network. If there is positive interest on the reserve asset, of course, that can be used to cover OPEX and other expenses uh, of the Libra Association and really ensure that the network operates smoothly. Uh, think about you know, supporting validator cost and, and other uh, dimensions of that type. And uh, as before, Libra coin holders will not receive any return, uh, positive return uh, from, from, from the reserve. Now, there's a lot of additional work uh, that is currently underway. Uh, from really ensuring competition and transparency in the market for designated dealers. These are, after all, the key interface between the ecosystem, VASP operating on the network, like wallets, exchanges, and others, and the reserve. Uh, and also defining a traditional recovery and resolution plan, uh, including things like a standby administration dealer and really processes for handling redemption under uh, very extreme uh, market conditions. Uh, we're also working on other dimensions like substitution risk, uh, you know, when it comes to emerging economies, and really thinking about how can countries take the best advantage of uh, flows like remittances without worrying about interference uh, with monetary policy. The broader idea is really to support integration with public sector efforts in this space. And, and really the future uh, that we're trying to build towards is one where as soon as I was mentioning, the public sector uh, is either upgrading their RTGS systems or opening up some of those interfaces or is exploring anything that uh, looks like a synthetic CBDC, retail CBDC, or wholesale CBDC, uh, Libra can integrate with those uh, efforts and, and stop even operating uh, a reserve. Uh, again, the focus of the network is in delivering payments and functionality around payments and financial services, not uh, running a reserve per se. But that's kind of a necessary step in, in, in this space where these assets are not fully digital and programmable uh, on the public sector side uh, today. Now, I, I mentioned this actually in, in my presentation last year, but another key dimension and one of the reasons why we landed on this particular uh, design for, for Libra is that we want to ensure that there's a thriving and competitive market for financial services and, and payments on top of it. And we really want to avoid vectors of concentration. As you probably know, many, many of the uh, consensus algorithms and pieces of consensus algorithms used today lead to different types of forms of concentration. For, for example, in proof of work, uh, you have concentration in mining. Uh, in proof of stake, you have concentration because of uh, initial seeding of capital among some of the participants. And so here we're really trying to strike a balance where when you think about why are there Libra Association members, well, they're really important for driving, uh, of course, utility and use cases in the network, but they're also solving the classic nothing at stake problem uh, that traditional proof of stake networks uh, typically face. Uh, these entities are bringing their reputation on the line and by running validator nodes, they're ensuring that the network is safe in some of the phases where you could think it's actually the most vulnerable. Uh, now, what's really important is that this network uh, keeps staying extremely competitive and it's not a wallet garden. Uh, the model is really that of the open technology standards uh, of the internet. And I'll expand more uh, around this in a second, but it's extremely important that there are open and transparent membership criteria uh, both for, you know, uh, for providing validator services and eventually also for governance. The goal here from an economics perspective is really to ensure extremely low switching costs for consumers and businesses relying on the network, low barriers to entry and, and extremely high interoperability. At the end of it, uh, building interoperability is probably one of the most important missions uh, of this project uh, if you want to get a financial inclusion. Uh, you know, we believe that com more competition would lead to lower prices. Uh, better quality, and, and also the development of a number of new services and business models that are difficult to, to predict today. Now, in the last part, I want to talk a little bit more about one of the most complex dimensions of trust, which is trust in the governance and future evolution of, of the network. As I was mentioning before, you know, Facebook that incubated some of the original ideas around this project is only one of 27 members. 
So can can only exert one, one vote out of uh, of 27 in total, and this will keep expanding, uh, of course, over time. And uh, as I mentioned also in the past, an independent and strong association is really a key prerequisite uh, for the success of this project. Um, founding members, of course, are needed to drive utility and adoption, uh, secure the network by running validator services, uh, and really bootstrap this kind of market for delegation and reputation uh, around the project. Uh, the economics are really similar to those of standard setting organization, and the goal is really one of distributed governance. Uh, that will encourage you know, individuals and organizations to build on the same ecosystem uh, rather than you know, reinforcing and increasing fragmentation, which is a known problem in payment and financial services. Uh, another key objective of the association is also, of course, avoiding a tragedy of the commons where everybody tries to build uh, on layers on top of, uh, of the base layer, the shared layer by everyone, and doesn't contribute enough resources back. Uh, to the investment in what really constitutes uh, a public public good and shared infrastructure. <clears throat> now, we began the Libra journey uh, by describing a shared vision, and, and this of course would have needed a new technology to transition the network to a fully permissionless, uh, permissionless one. And uh, that vision was really inspired by some of the key economic properties of permissionless networks. So what, what happened uh, is that one of the concerns that we heard from regulators about that vision was that you know, we were introducing a number of um, additional provisions from AML to compliance uh, to really ensure that the network is safe and is good at fighting financial crime. And regulators were concerned that if the network were to fully transition to permissionless, those provisions could be removed. And so you wouldn't be able to guarantee the health and integrity of the network uh, in a fully transitioned way. Now, what we discovered through this process was also that we believe it is still possible to replicate the key economic properties of permissionless systems uh, through actually traditional market design and auction design, and essentially through an open, transparent, and competitive market uh, process uh, for the provision both of network services, again, think about entities that want to run a validator, but also for governance uh, and, and membership in the, in the association. As you may know, Libra, you know, is building on, on, on BFT uh, through hot stuff. And, um, you know, the, the BFT consensus protocols have, have a number of advantages uh, in terms of throughput, latency, and, and, you know, the no need for wasteful computation, for example. Uh, there's additional good features around finality. Uh, but at the same time, you know, as an economist, one of the things that uh, worries me the most about BFT is that, of course, the security depends on the quality and the incentives of those initial validators. You're essentially trusting them uh, with the operations of the network. And uh, as we know, incentive alignment around all of these issues is, is and can be very hard. Um, now, the network, of course, is, is a public good. It's a shared infrastructure. And so you often run into a tension between some of the short run objectives. Think about the needs of the network in its early days when you're trying to bootstrap it and, and increase utility versus more long run objectives. Uh, so allowing for uh, additional uh, validators or additional governance members to come and compete with the existing one. Uh, and so the next steps of the Libra process are really trying to drive a balance to, uh, to really ensure competition for services and governance within uh, a framework where you know, nodes and validators will need to be compliant. Now, the good news is that we can really learn from market design and other uh, economic systems that really face similar problems uh, where you do have you know, a trusted set, but you're also trying to introduce market forces uh, within that set. <clears throat> we believe that competition is a prerequisite, again, for building you know, a highly interoperable, efficient, and especially innovative payment system. So at any point in time, new entrants need to be able to compete with the existing players within the Libra ecosystem for not only the provision of payments and financial services, this is both to businesses and consumers, <clears throat> but also the opportunity to run independent validator nodes uh, to contribute to security, reliability of the network, uh, and also you know, through um, uh, introducing uh, less correlated uh, failure risk. Uh, the, difficult, the most difficult one on, on the dimension of competition is really active participation in the governance and the evolution of this project. So the, you know, the first two, um, so the first actually, the first one uh, is already uh, achieved by the fact that, again, the entire network is modeled after an open technology standard, but items number two and three really require working on this market-driven process 
that will allow new qualified members uh, to enter and compete with the existing ones. And this is really a novel uh, concept that we're bringing, I think, to this space. <clears throat> so what may this look like, right? Um, uh, again, together with the, the non-transitioning to permissionless, this become really the key step for ensuring uh, that you do have um, an open and transparent and competitive market uh, for, for resources and, and for governance. Uh, this applies to both the phase of expanding membership in the association and also renewing membership. And I'll give you a little bit more details um, in a second. The goal is really to offering new entrants the ability to compete on, on all of these dimensions uh, while at the same time ensuring that Libra Association can meet and uh, you know upheld its values on, on regulatory expectations on issues like you know AML and compliance and, and so on. <clears throat> so when you think about expanding membership, you could imagine a process, and again, this is still a uh, work in progress with, with the membership, uh, where uh, there's a series of open calls and you know the association declares how many uh, membership slots will be available in each round. There'll be some objective dimensions like uh, the application could cover things like basic information about the applicant uh, to really ensure that it meets the compliance bar, uh, as well as technical information. <clears throat> Would the applicant be able to successfully run a secure and stable validator node? And then more nuanced dimensions like economic performance. Is this an applicant that will really contribute to the further growth of the ecosystem? Uh, and of course, you know, to ensure that there's funding for OPEX and other dimensions of the association, uh, there could also be a financial contribution in this. You could use this information to, to essentially calculate a transparent membership contribution score. Uh, this is used often in, in other kind of application processes. Uh, of course, these terms, uh, you know, for calculating such a score uh, should be public before an open call is run. Um, and this is actually used in a number of allocation mechanisms today. Uh, this would ensure that you know any potential entrant to use this information to decide if they want to make an investment in the Libra network and, and kind of start becoming a validator or maybe even becoming a member uh, of the governance or not. Similarly, you could use a similar process, which is essentially using auction design uh, to rank potential uh, slots and entrants, also to kind of renew the membership set and ensure that it can really keep innovating and, and advancing uh, over time. Of course, all of this, these decisions would have to be made taking you know, in, into consideration any antitrust or any competition issues, uh, as well, of course, the regulatory compliance requirements, which are really the entry point uh, for participating in, in a network of, of this type. Now, I want to spend uh, the last few minutes to kind of go back to the broader mission, uh, which is really to enable equal access uh, to financial services. Interoperability, lower cost, lower frictions, uh, I believe can make a massive progress, uh, both in domestic markets, but especially in cross border. Uh, too many people today uh, really don't have access to basic uh, payments and financial services. And the irony is that often uh, there's large segments of the population, so one in nine people globally, are often supported by funds that they're receiving through a remittance from family and friends. Uh, the, the aggravating factor is also that people with less money tend to pay more uh, for financial services today. Uh, and, you know, the World Bank estimates uh, that you've probably heard before uh, is of a, approximately a 7% cost for sending money across borders. So that means that if you're sending $200, you know, approximately $14 are lost uh, to the intermediary. Not only are you're, you're, you're spending a lot of money in some of these cross-border flows, uh, but transactions also take time. So these are not immediate transfers. And in some cases, it can be multiple days before someone receives uh, money on the other hand. I believe the, the COVID situation has made this even more salient, where you've seen a number of governments struggle even in, in stimulus payments or in getting money in the hands of their citizens uh, within a reasonable time frame. And the situation is likely to be more aggravated as we enter kind of a very long and potentially painful economic recovery phase. Uh, now, the good news, uh, which I'd mentioned also last time, is that, yes, there are approximately 1.7 billion people uh, without a bank account, without access to low-cost <coughs> payments and financial services, but a large number of these have access to a mobile phone, and the majority of that subset has access to some form of data. And so there's a lot that can be done by bringing a network that's truly interoperable, that favors competition, and can allow a number of startups across the globe uh, to enter with new services and, and new options for uh, consumers. 
I look forward to your question and thank you very much for your attention.